Thank you everybody. I am very happy to be here today and have the chance to tell you about my great passion, LMAS Telescope Mounts. My name is Nils Hay. I'm the founder and owner of Track Stars, a company placed uh, outside Copenhagen in Denmark. Today I would like to tell you about LMAS Mount. And we have an agenda here where I will start telling a little bit about myself and my journey into amateur astronomy. After that, we'll try and make a comparison of telescope mounts, and that will be a comparison between LS mount and the polar aligned mount. Following that, we'll look into how we can do astrophotography on LS mount, and that is divided in two separate uh, parts. One about short exposure, astrophotography where we use short exposure to freeze the field rotation, and after that, long exposure astrophotography, where we use a derotator device to uh, compensate for the field rotation. And I'll get back to what field rotation is in a little while. <clears throat> and finally, you'll have a chance to ask some questions, if you might have any at the end. <clears throat> I started uh, my journey into amateur astronomy uh, when I was 12 years old. I got a small 3-inch ref uh, refractor and had that for a couple of years and then I got a 6-inch Newtonian telescope on a motorized mount. We are back in the, the 1980s at this time. And uh, I started doing astrophotography, even though at that time it was quite complicated. It was film, it was darkroom, uh, developing films, it was manual guiding and all kinds of uh, problems, we can call them, just guiding a, guiding a picture, doing that manually, it was like pay, playing a computer game, staring at the crosshair and pushing the buttons all the time to keep the star more or less centered in the image. So it was really uh, the hard days, but it was also, also great fun. And I still enjoy astrophotography and have, has of course followed the technological development today with all the auto guiding and all the uh, digital cameras and all the stuff we have today. So today what we can do in a few minutes was what took weeks or months to do back in the 80s. But it was, it was great fun. Then in uh, 1986 I was so lucky to spend three months um, in Australia uh, for the return of uh, Halley's Comet. I stayed uh, with the family of Peter Gillingham, who was the technical director of the 3.9 meter Anglo-Australian telescope here at Siding Spring Observatory. And he lived somewhere just down the mountains here in the flat area here. So it was a real wonderful dark place uh, to observe from and lots of clear skies. I brought my own telescope, which was a, a six inch Newtonian. I had built so it could be it could be um, packed into a suitcase, so I brought it all in, in my standard luggage there. And I used that for imaging and uh, visual observation of uh, Halley's Comet, and of course all the splendid great deep sky objects from the southern hemisphere. And I actually had some quite fun experiences observing down there. One of the first nights I was out there and I was guiding the telescope, so I was staring at the eyepiece and suddenly I heard something making a noise uh, behind me and I turned around and looked and about five meters away a kangaroo about the same size as me was standing and then suddenly it jumped more or less towards me and passed just two meters from me and then went into the, the grass somewhere here behind. It was quite a scary experience the first time but I, I saw them regularly a little bit more distance while I was there at night but I got used to that they were very friendly but uh, Quite, quite funny experience. And of course I took some pictures of Halley's Comet on film with a telephoto lens. So it was quite a nice comet from, from that part of, of the world. When I um, returned to Denmark after my, my stay down there, I started my education as a uh, mechanical engineer. And I have uh, worked for different Danish technology companies and uh, the last 10 years I've been running the company Track the Stars, where I still do my daily business. 
That was a little bit about me. Let's move on and talk about this comparison of, uh, of telescope mounts. <clears throat> if we look first at the polar line mount, then the polar line mount is known by that it has a polar axis that you have to, when you set up the mount, you have to align the polar axis so that it's precisely parallel with the rotation axis of the Earth. When you have done that, the polar line mount have that advantage that you can track objects in the sky just by rotating at a constant speed around the polar axis. If you do that, the telescope will move in a big arc because of the tilted axis and follow the same movement as the stars over the sky. When the polar line mount or the German equatorial mount was developed by Fraunhofer, I think it was in 1824 or something like that, it was quite important to have that uh, solution because the only kind of clock or motor drive you could make was a mechanical clock and that could uh, be made with a fixed speed and it was possible to get the mount to track the sky by using a, a mechanical clock. If we look at the uh, altitude azimuth mount or LS mount, uh, it is set up with a uh, vertical azimuth axis and a horizontal altitude axis. That means the telescope moves in a relative to the local, you can say, horizon where you're observing from. So the telescope, if you rotate it, will always follow the horizon or it will go um, straight up and down if you rotate it around the, the altitude axis. That means that when you want to track the stars that moves in these big arcs over the sky, you need to rotate around both axes at the same time. And therefore, back in the days of, of these early mounts, that was not possible. But when we got the microcontrollers and things like that in our telescope mount about 30 years ago, since then it has been very easy to calculate the speed and to perform that operation to, to rotate the two axes to track objects across the sky. And that's the reason why that altitude azimuth mounts are more popular or are popular today. And if you look at it, all uh, big professional telescopes being built today are built with altitude, axis, uh, altitude azimuth mounts. And that is also because when you have the, the um, vertical as you would access, the telescope is more compact and better balanced, so it can be easier to construct the telescope. <clears throat> a few examples of these two types of mounts that's available on the market today for amateur astronomers. We have here three uh, polar aligned mounts. Both of these here are uh, German equatorial mounts, where you have the, the polar axis here and here. You have counterweight and a declination axis. And another option is a fork mounted um, system where the uh, polar, mount, uh, polar axis is, is uh, tilted by putting a wedge here so that it's, it gets polar aligned. On the LX mounts, we have some different types here, and there are actually three different types. The first one here uh, is a fork mount. This one with a small refractor is also a fork mount, and the famous uh, Dobson mount is also a fork mount. These three are based on, 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 on a fork mount principle. Then you have uh, this mount, it's, it's a side mounted where the telescope is placed on the side of the uh, azimuth axle and finally a uh, mount where the telescope is placed on the top, on top of the azimuth axle. If we look more into uh, this comparison between the two, two, two types, then we have selected a number of parameters that I would like to, to go through and, and see how they compare there. <clears throat> if we look at the portability, then there's no doubt that the altitude azimuth mount is easier to transport. For example, uh, when you look at the, the German equatorial mount, just the shape of a typical head with a um, the axis with a counterweight and the shape means it's quite bulky and if you want to put it into a transport box well it has a certain shape to be able to, to hold the head where if you design the uh, an azimuth mount with the, with the benefit you get from that design it can be a lot uh, more compact and easier to, uh, to transport and for most of us that's important because if we don't have an observatory we have to bring them out into the garden, the backyard, or we have to bring it sometimes to a distant place where, where the sky is, is better. 
next step is uh, setting up. And again, the altitude azimuth mount is easier to, uh, to set up than the polar line mount. Because when you set up the LDS mount, well, there's no leveling needed. You can just set up the tripod or the pier and then go on from there. Where typically on the polar line mount, you have to level the base of the pier and you have to point it in a certain direction um, relative to the, to the compass to be able to perform the polar alignment. Polar alignment for the altitude azimuth mount, there is no polar alignment. So the operation you need to perform on the polar alignment mount, that could be using, a, for example, a, a polar alignment scope. You have to kneel down and look up uh, near the celestial pole. And on these uh, devices, typically you have to turn this uh, pattern you have in, you can see in the telescope to, to match some uh, constellation in the sky. And then you have to center the, the pole star into um, the position here by adjusting the, the, the polar alignment screw on, on the mount. That is one way you can do it. On some newer mount, you can also do it by the, using the electronic on the mount, but you still have to perform the, the adjustment and center the star uh, or one or two stars into the, the eyepiece to, to perform this uh, operation. Next step when you set up is uh, to perform the star alignment and that I would say is the same whether you have a polar line mount or an LS mount. You have to center one, two or three stars a little, little bit depending on the type of mount but you have to center them in the, in the eyepiece and align on them and then you are ready to, uh, to, to, use, to use the mount. If you are a visual observer I'm sure you know that it's important to have a good position when you, uh, when you observe. If you are a skilled deep sky observer, you know that you need to sit relaxed for some period of time to really get the details and see all the details in, in, the, in the field of view. That means that you need an unstressed position. And the, the altitude azimuth mount gives a better solution there than the polar alignment the line mount. Because on the polar line mount, because you have this pattern where the, where the telescope moves like this, that means the eyepiece, if this is the eyepiece, it will be pointing like this, and then when you get to 1000 it will be like this, and it will, it will move like this when, you, when the telescope slews around the sky. And even when you pass the uh, meridian with the meridian flip, it will be turned upside down. Where on the LS mount, the eyepiece is always straight up, wherever you point the telescope, it will be in the same angle all the time. So it's easier to observe and to have a good angle without needing to readjust in the eyepieces all the time. Just back to Australia uh, once more. When I was there, I was um, lucky to get to, uh, of course, see the, the 3.9 meter telescope. And this image is a newer image because here are all kinds of cables and cameras here. But when I was there, there was a chair in here. For the observer and I uh, got the chance to get up to sit in this chair unfortunately only in daytime with the blue sky so uh, I didn't see to, I got to observe with it they were too busy for that but I got the chance to sit here and it was quite amazing they slewed the telescope up and you get up about uh, 20 meters it's up in this up there above the mirror but what happens because this is a polar line mount it has a what's called a horseshoe mount so when a telescope slewed around the sky, well, this whole tube turned. And the seat you were sitting in, first you were sitting very nice here, but suddenly the seat tilted to the side and kind of moved up the side of, of the wall, of the tube rotated. But then, luckily there were two push buttons to rotate the seat inside this. So you just push that and you move yourself down to the bottom again. So when the telescope was slewing around, you had to sit with pushing on these two buttons to keep the seat in, a, in the lowest position. So that's a very good illustration of uh, what happens when, when a polar alignment mount uh, slows around. It was quite fun to have that chance to sit up there. <coughs> okay, next thing here is uh, what is called the meridian flip. And uh, the meridian flip is uh, a problem related to the polar alignment mount. What happens is, if you look at the animation here, when the telescope uh, slews from east toward south, then when it reaches, reaches south, 
the telescope has to swing around to move to the other side of the, um, of the polar axis, otherwise it will hit into the pier and the, um, or the tripod. So just around thousand, the telescope makes this, uh, needs to make this flip around, meaning that all the equipment, your guide scope and your other stuff, ends up on the other side. And if you have a mirror telescope, the mirror is also being turned the other way around, which is not optimal uh, in the mirror sill and things like that. So it's not a very uh, smart thing to have the, the, the meridian flip. On the azimuth mount, well, the telescope can move full circle all, all around without uh, doing anything than just, yeah, just moving in, in, the same, in the same direction. So that, that makes it it's, uh, it's very easy. And the problem also with the, with the meridian flip on, on the on the um, polar line mount is that it uh, often happen around, uh, it happens around the house where you are, if you're imaging, well, you have to stop imaging, you have to reposition your system when it has made the uh, Merican flip and then you can restart uh, your imaging. So it's not, it's not optimal. <coughs> if you use your mount in an observatory, then the LX mount is more compact. If you can see, if you have a uh, for example, a dome, observatory dome, and you place an LX mount right in the center of the dome. Then the telescope and the dome will rotate around the same center, meaning the distance between the telescope and the dome will always be the same, wherever you go in, inside the, the dome. Um, whereas when you look at the equatorial mount, then you have sometimes the telescope is on the west side of the polar uh, axis, and sometimes it's on the east side when it has made this Merican flip. So the size of the dome has to be larger to fit the same size of telescope. And another thing is when you look out through the slit, the uh, LS mount centered in the dome will always look straight out through the slit, where the uh, equatorial mount will have to look a little bit from this side, or when it has made the flip, it will look a little bit the other way into, into the slit. So it's uh, more difficult to position the slit automatically uh, when you have that system. Finally, we have what is called field rotation. And field rotation, uh, I'll try and explain what that is. If you um, look at the moon when it rises in east, the half moon here, you'll see that the top of the moon will be tilted a little bit to the left. If you later in the night look at the moon again, when it has reached south, the half moon will be more or less um, vertical. And when it sets in, in west, it will be lying a little bit to the right, tilted a little bit to the right. And that comes from the movement of this big arc so that the moon, moon and all other objects moves over the sky. Um, and as we talked about before, the polar line mount moves in this pattern, so uh, it will follow the same uh, pattern as the sky, meaning that the object will stay in the same uh, angle in the field of view. So on the polar line mount, there will be no field rotation. If we look at the azimuth mount, then the telescope is moving along the horizon, meaning if you set the camera with the you can say the bottom of the, of the sensor is uh, along the horizon and move it, it will stay along the horizon. So when you look at the moon in the east, I don't know if you can see the red frame from down there, but it uh, shows the camera size. Well, then the moon will be tilted to the left in the picture. If you take one in the south, it will be straight up. And if you take one in the west, it will be tilted the other way. And when we take, take if we go into uh, long exposure astrophotography, then this rotation will show up in the pictures as the stars will be into circular trails. So that's the, what is known as, as field rotation. If we try and sum up these uh, parameters that we have made the comparison with, then you can see uh, we have a lot of uh, positive things for the altitude azimuth mount, but the field rotation is of course a negative thing. If you are a visual observer, Field rotation is not an issue because you are not watching through the eyepieces for hours and seeing that the field very slowly rotates. It's not, it's not something that happens fast, so you won't notice as a, as a visual observer. So from that point of view, for visual obs observations, well, an azimuth mount will always be um, better than the polar line mount. And as you can see, a lot of visual observers, they use, for example, the, the Dobson mount, extremely popular for that. 
and that's of course also an <coughs> LDS mood mount. So we won't use so much time for the for the visual observation. If we look at astrophotography, then we have the minor thing here is the field rotation. The other uh, points are also quite positive for the um, LDS mount, but field rotation is the issue. So the question is now, and what we're going to look at, how do we handle the field rotation and get rid of that so we can use the mount also for astrophotography. Next, uh, we'll look at the LA's short exposure uh, astrophotography. And uh, short exposure astrophotography on a LAS mount, in that uh, relation to that, we use very short exposures or, or short exposures to freeze the field rotation. So if you keep the exposures under a specific number of seconds, then there will be no field rotation visible in the individual subs, and then you can stack these to get the final image. And with uh, the new modern cameras, uh, with very low readout noise, you can actually do quite nice results with that technique. <coughs> Let's look at uh, some of the uh, things you need to do to, to take this kind of, uh, of images. First of all, you need um, a good quality LAS mount. By good quality, I mean that it has to be able to track at least for, for, a, for a shorter period of time, fairly precise, and it needs to have a stability that's needed for imaging. So it does not need to be a very uh, high-end mount, but it needs to be of a good stable quality. Then you should uh, aim for a camera with a low readout noise. In this uh, kind of astrophotography short exposure, it's typical to take perhaps several hundred uh, individual subframes. And if you have a lot of readout noise on these, then that will be a problem. So a low readout noise is, um, is quite important. But actually, most of the new uh, CMOS cameras and also many of the new DSLR cameras do have fairly low readout noise. So they work uh, very well with this technique. Again, because we have a limited exposure time, it's important to have a telescope with a low F number, or you can call it a fast optical system. In this example here, I've shown, of course, all the Smith camera designs, which are extremely fast, F2, but you can also use uh, Newtonian or telephoto lenses. And actually, a lot of the pictures I've taken myself, I've taken at F7, which is not that fast, and that works too. So, I would say there's a lot of possibilities, but of course, the faster the system, the better it will work with these short exposures. Then you need to uh, pick the right objects for this kind of imaging. So you need objects with a good uh, surface brightness. An example could be uh, globular clusters and also the brighter planetary nebulas. But it's important that you look for the surface brightness and not the total brightness. As an example, the ring nebula is magnitude 9 and it's about 2 arc minutes big and it's actually quite a high, it has a quite high surface brightness. It's very well uh, for this kind of imaging. But if you take another very no, known planetary nebula, the Helix Nebula, it's magnitude 6, which should be a lot brighter, but it's more uh, the size of the moon in the sky. It's about the same size. So the surface brightness, even though it's magnitude 6, the surface brightness is a lot lower. So it's not nearly as good to image as uh, the ring nebula. So when you pick the object, you have to consider the surface brightness of the object. Another object that works a central part of uh, the bright uh, gas nebula, like Orion nebula or um, the Laguna nebula, can be used. And actually there are a lot more other, other objects. These are just some, some examples. <clears throat> then you need to align the mount carefully. You want to have the best possible tracking. Well, then it's important to align it carefully. And by aligning carefully, I mean use a crosshair or use the camera sensor and then be sure to center the alignment stars uh, fairly precise in the field of view. It does not take very long time, but it will give the, the best results. Auto guiding. Um, if you go for very short stops, which some objects can do, then you don't need to, to auto guide. But if you're having a little bit longer uh, stops, then I would recommend that you use uh, auto guiding. Auto guiding on an LS mount is exactly as on an equatorial mount or polar line mount. It's just as easy. 
So with uh, some of the, the available software packages, it can be done extremely easily. One important thing is that you need to pick a guide star uh, close to the target. Because what happens when you guide an ace mount? It means that you lock, you kind of you lock the, 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 the mount or the telescope onto this alignment star, and you keep that one centered because you you lock alignment star, guide star. You guide on this star, so that will be locked to the same position. So if you took a long exposure, let's say 20 minute exposure of that, then you'll see the guide star as a pinpoint star and all the other stars will look like they have rotated around that. It will look like a star train picture of Polaris with the guide star as Polaris right in the center. So it's important that you keep your target as close as possible to, to that star because if it's very far away then the arc, you can say the stars move over time, is larger so you'll get a bigger movement close to the orbit and that will shorten your the possible exposure time. So find a guide star that's close to the object. That's always a good idea. And now the most important part of doing this kind of uh, astrophotography, that is to pick the right exposure time for the individual subs. And there are two things to consider. They have to be so short that you don't get any field rotation in the individual sub. I mean, you should have pinpoint star all over the field of view. But still, they should be as long as possible so that you get as much signal as possible on your image. And the field rotation is changed, is different. The speed of the field rotation is not the same everywhere. It depends on two things. It depends on the latitude of the, of, of the observer, where you are on, on the Earth, what latitude you are on, and then it depends on where the object is in the sky. As an example, if your object is in east or west, there's actually the, the field rotation change direction actually in east and west. So at, in east and west, the field rotation is very small and you can do actually quite long exposure time in east and west. In north and south, the field rotation is a bit, it's a bit larger. So it depends on where you are in the sky. I will not go into uh, the calculations on this, that's a little bit complicated, but what I have done is I've made some tables. You can see one here. You don't need to read it now. I will show you a link later where you can find these tables on my website. But uh, what you can see in this table, you can, you can, when you decide to image an object, you can look in the table and see how many seconds can I expose this object at this time. You have to decide when you're taking the picture. Then you can, you can find the optimal, uh, the optimal exposure time. This example we have over here of uh, the Ryan Nebula, that's a single 30 second exposure. Actually, the table says something like uh, 27 seconds is, is maximum. This is a 30 second exposure. And what I've done is I've tried to cut out this corner and magnify it a little bit. I'll just show you this on the next page. Here you can see a single 30 second exposure. The stars are perfectly uh, round and no trails. And then I have taken 60, 90, and 120 seconds. And if you look at the 120 seconds, you can easily see that they're starting to, to give some arcs from the field rotation. Based on this, it's up to you to decide when you're emitting how much, how long do I want to make the subs. If you do 60 seconds and 30 seconds, they are perfectly circular. 60 seconds, it's hard to see that there are any problems, so perhaps something in between would, would be a good, uh, good solution. But if you stick to the numbers in the table, you are sure that you get perfect, perfect round stars. Final thing, now we have taken the subs, and I forgot to say, this was the, the exposure time you find in the other table is the exposure time for one stop. After that, you can take as many subs as you like. So if you want to do two hours, three hours, four hours on an object, well, you can just do that. It's only a matter of how many subs you, uh, you pick or you take after each other. And when you have all the subs, they will, of course, slowly be rotated. The, not the individual one will look like they are pinpoint, but over time they will rotate. But well, that's no problem because all the different uh, software packages that we can use for stacking our images, they all handle this without any extra feature. They do it automatically. So when you have stacked all of these frames, you will get one picture that's perfectly aligned. You might need to crop a little bit from the corners because they have rotated, but the center of the image, the largest part of the image will, will, be, will be okay. 
So that's the technique for taking these. I will not go into image processing or anything, but because that's not part of this, we'll talk with the mount, but it's till you now you have your final raw data that you can, you can work on. And just a few examples here. Um, NGC 891 in Andromeda, that's uh, 10 second stops, 840 of them, it's quite a large number, and that's 2.3 hours. And that's actually why we talked about how fast the system is then taking at F F7. And another one also uh, at F7, the ring nebula. And this is actually one second exposures, but 2,000 of them, so it's uh, 33 minutes. Okay, let's move on and uh, talk about uh, long exposure astrophotography, where the use of a derotor device is needed to get the real uh, equatorial tracking. The first thing when you want to do long exposure astrophotography with an LS mount is of course to get a good quality, and now I'll say a high quality mount. When we are talking about long exposure, we need to be able to track objects for uh, half an hour, perhaps, or something like that, for, for real long stops. And that, of course, means that you need a good quality mount to, to do that. <clears throat> Next thing, and the most important thing to discuss here, that is uh, how do we uh, handle the field rotation. And to do that, we need a field uh, rotation device. And there are two uh, possibilities available today, either a telescope rotator or a camera rotator. And let's look a little bit more at these two principles. The camera rotator rotates just the camera. So it, it's installed between the telescope tube and the camera and rotates the camera on the back end of the telescope. <coughs> Because of that, it can of course only be used to take pictures through the telescope and not in anything else. When you're guiding the system like that, you need to use an off-axis guider. You can't guide with a guide scope mounted on the scope that's not rotating. You need to guide on a guide camera that rotates together with the camera. For example, as shown in this image here, the guide camera is sitting here and the rotator is here. So the guide camera and the imaging camera are rotating together. The camera rotator can rotate all the way around, so it means it can take as long subs or an image as long as you like. It will follow the sky all night. And as you have no meridian flip on the, on the um, LDAS mount, you can actually image from the optic rises until the optic sits. There's no limits there. And one extra feature you get from the camera rotator is of course that you can use it to frame the target. So when you want to decide how to, to frame it, well, you can, you can rotate the, the image uh, remotely by rotating the, the rotator. The telescope rotator, which actually is a device that um, I have made for the, the Panther mount, and it's the only unit that's, that's available uh, to get. And it works so that it installs between the uh, the mount and the telescope tube. So it rotates the entire telescope tube around the optical axis. So the, te the telescope is installed in this dovetail and is rotated around its optical axis. It can be used both for imaging through the telescope, but also anything that you mount on top of the telescope, a camera uh, with a telephoto lens, a guide camera, everything will track equatorially. So you can take all kinds of images if you mount it on top of the um, on top of, the, of, the, of the, uh, the, the main telescope. Guiding, well you can do it both off-axis or uh, piggyback uh, with an individual guide scope. It doesn't matter what you select there. One thing to uh, uh, remember here is that it must be uh, rewound every one to two hours. If you image in east and west it can be uh, for s some more hours, but in most part of the sky one to two hours. And that's because the rotation is limited to around 30 degrees. So when it reaches the end, you have to rewind it and start again. But then you can do, still do as long exposures as you like. And so the combined exposure time can be as long as you like. You just need to, to rewind it at, at that time.
camera, anything you like can be used here because again you are free, you have you can take as long subs as you like, you can do exactly as you like. So the peak of a good camera here is the same as with any other kind of, of imaging, also with a with a polar light mount. There, there, there's no different in in, uh, in what you select there. A little bit of the same with a telescope. You can use what telescope you like. Again, some telescopes are more suitable for imaging than others, but it has nothing to do with the mount here because, again, you can take as long stops as you like. One thing to uh, remember here is if you look at these types we have here, if it's um, like this uh, astrograph, Rasa astrograph, where the camera is installed in the, on the front, you can't use a camera rotator, it won't fit there. So you can only use that with the telescope rotator. And the same is for the, um, for the telephoto lens, can also only be used on a telescope rotator. Where on the refractor and the Newtonian telescope here, you could install a rotation device uh, for the camera instead. But if it's a Smith camera with an with a astrograph there with a the front mounted camera, you need to meet the telescope rotator. Align the mount precisely, well I won't say anything about that, the same as I said before for the short exposure, need to be precise. Again, auto guiding also, now we are talking lungs up, so I would say always auto guiding, uh, pick the guide star close to the target. Exposure time. There's no limits now, you can do as long as you like. The mount will be tracking. Now I said no limit, but you have one to two hours with a telescope rotator, and I don't think anybody will do subs more than one or two hours. They might do combined many hours, but not the individual subs will not be, uh, will not be in hours. And image processing, same principle as for any other uh, mount where you do long exposure astrophotography. The, all the images will be aligned, and it's just a matter of of uh, doing as, as usual. And a few examples. Um, a picture of Comet Shack passing the Hart Nebula. It's uh, five times two minutes with a Canon camera, on the, and that's on the Panther mount with the telescope rotator. And another image here of uh, the Cocoon Nebula. It's 6.5 hours. It's also with the uh, panther mount with the with the telescope rotator, and then finally an example of an image with a camera rotator. You can't really see any different what it's taken with, but this is with a with a camera rotator, and that's two hours in H alpha of the central part of the Rosette Nebula. Oh, sorry. As I said before, I had these tables uh, showing where you can pick or find the, the best exposure time for um, short exposure astrophotography and also actually general information about uh, this kind of uh, imaging and, and also about the telescope mount can be found on this website, telescopemount.org. So you can have a look there if you, if you want to see these tables and there are tables for all the different latitudes of uh, where the observ observation can be made from. Summing all this up, I have three uh, key points here. First, the modern LDS mounts, they are easier to transport, set up and use than polar line mounts. Field rotation on the LDS mounts can be eliminated with modern rotators. And finally, adding these two up, my claim is that the balance between polar line mount and LDS mount is changing. Don't know where the balance is right now, but it's changing. There are more benefits coming from, from uh, the LDS mount and the new technology uh, development uh, moves in, in that direction. Finally, uh, just a few words about the telescope mount that we produce in uh, Track the Stars. We have two different mounts that we make. We have the transportable uh, Panther mount. It has a capacity of uh, 25 kilos. And it's possible to add the telescope rotator if you want to do imaging, or you can use it for visual observation or short exposure astrophotography without the, without the rotator. And the system is made for transport, so the whole mount and the pier can be handled in two, in two compact bags. 
The other mount we have is uh, an observatory mount called Mammoth, and it has a capacity of uh, 60 to 70 kilos, and uh, it's a very compact system that can fit in a, in a small observatory or a small dome, but still carry a, a large telescope. But it's only for observatory use. Thank you very much for listening, and perhaps you have some questions. <laughs>